Uh, let's go ahead and wrap up our video lecture for chapter 11. Uh, so let's talk about Islam and Indian society. So Islam grows in popularity uh, in India, especially amongst the lower case people. Um, so the question is, what does it do? Okay. Uh, so Islam, of course, promotes promises social equality uh, because all Muslims are equal under the eyes of Allah. Uh, but the fact is that the case system is what it is, and it will not allow people to rise from their status because uh, the case system is very rigid and it doesn't change, right? It doesn't allow for social mobility. So even though a lot of people convert to Islam looking for opportunities, uh, creating, getting a new religion isn't going to change much, right? Because you need education, you need opportunities, you need something else. So if your whole life you've been a peasant farmer, and all of a sudden you're a Muslim peasant farmer, Nothing's going to change, right, without more, without more help. And the fact is that Islam, as you know, strong as and popular as it was, did not bring those changes to India. Uh, also, we see, that, uh, we see that India's population is going to grow dramatically. Uh, we see the introduction and the increased use of rice, right, which came from originally from China and Southeast Asia. We're going to see the expansion of uh, irrigation systems especially in southern India, which tends to be a, little, a lot more drier. Uh, therefore, they need better systems of water conservation. Uh, and a lot of the, the construction of irrigation systems are funded by temples, uh, by Hindu temples, which adds to the popularity of Hinduism uh, in southern India. Uh, so during this time, the population of India will double uh, from 50 million to 100 million. Uh, and during the post-classical era, uh, which is right behind China, right? Just like now, how China is number one, India is number two. Same thing uh, is pretty much for most of human history. Uh, and um, so India's population increases and it becomes more urbanized because you have these new cities. Uh, Delhi, of course, being the, the new political capital of northern India. Uh, Calicut is, another, is a major trade center, uh, as is Cambay. So here we see the growth of the uh, Indian population. Uh, so India and China have the fastest growing populations in the world, and they have the largest populations in the world. Uh, and when we compare it to places like Europe during this time, Europe has their population is barely growing at all. Now, um, in, in Islam, of course, we know that uh, Muslim women are considered to be equal, uh, and they are provided a lot of rights, even though they, of course, they also have a lot of restrictions uh, like being veiled and being accompanied by a male guardian. Um, so when Islam arrived to India, and many people convert to Islam, uh, and many you know women convert to Islam, the idea was that some of these rights and privileges that Islam affords women would now be passed to Muslim women in India, right? And the fact is that it didn't, right? Because Indian society was so strict... Uh, and so patriarchal that it didn't give Muslim Indian women uh, any rights, right? Uh, even though they, they were supposed to get rights. So Muslim women in, in the Islamic Empire, in the Caliphate, Muslim women in Persia or in Arabia or in Egypt, right, they were given rights, right? They were given, you know, the right to, to choose their, their marriage. They were given the right to divorce. They were given the right to own property. They were given the right to... Uh, or, uh, keep the dowry, which is the money that the husband paid for the marriage. And all these rights were granted to Muslim women in other parts of the world, right? In other parts of Dar al Islam. But in India, that didn't happen. So the status of Indian women stayed the same, extremely low, extremely, uh, you know, lower to com in compared to the men. Uh, and again, this is a strong patriarchal society. And so we see that the kind of the social traditions of India keep Islam from impacting it or changing it too much. It's kind of the same exact thing that happened in sub-Saharan Africa, right? How the traditions of the sub-Saharan African societies, right, of being matrilineal and being, you know, giving women a lot of rights, how Islam's arrival didn't really affect those traditions, those, you know, that status of women, right? So in, you know, in Africa... Uh, Islam didn't bring down the status of women. And in India, Islam didn't bring up the status of women. 
Um, so it's a weird kind of like effect that we see there. All right, uh, cultural achievements, cultural achievements. Here we see a temple, a Hindu temple. Uh, and Indian culture is going to be influential to other parts of the world, especially the Muslim world, uh, including the Abbasids. Remember, the Abbasids, they're going to have this huge cultural city as their political capital, which is Baghdad, right? You know, modern day Iraq. Uh, and the Indians, you know, mathematicians, are going to create the Arabic uh, numerals. They're going to spread it to the Muslims. The Muslims are going to spread it to the Europeans. Uh, and the um, and we see all these advancements in math, uh, you know, so that they start in India, they spread elsewhere eventually. Um, we also see that the Sultanate of Delhi, they're going to sponsor a lot of architecture, because of course, like any other ruler, they want to express their devotion, but also express their political power by showing off and building uh, cool buildings. Uh, so one of the things that they do is that they will uh, build mosques, uh, with, of course, is Islamic geometric art, which is the, um, uh, you know, the, the standard because they don't have images. Uh, and also, they're going to uh, incorporate some Hindu architecture into their designs. Uh, and what tended to happen is that they would uh, destroy or, or, or bring down Hindu shrines and Hindu temples and in their place, right, right on top of it, build a mosque, right? So kind of like adding insult to injury. Now, the most famous of these is this one called Kutab Minar, right? So uh, basically, originally, this was a Hindu temple. Uh, and we see a lot of the, you know, like the domes are, are, are very popular in Hindu architecture. Um, and these kind of like tall arches as well. Uh, and then we see these huge, 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 huge towers, right? Um, so we see that, you know, they're blending the uh, Indian architecture, the Hindu architecture with the Islamic architecture and kind of creating this kind of like hybrid syncretic version of uh, architecture. Same thing happens with language. Uh, and uh, we see the development of a new language. Right? Just like Swahili was a new language, a synchronized language. Same thing happens in northern, uh, northern India with the development of a new language called Urdu. And Urdu is a mix of three languages. It's Arabic, right, which is Muslims, uh, the, the language of, of Islam. Uh, Farsi, which is the Persian language. Right, so we have India here, we have Pakistan here, and Iran is right here. Right? Iran or Persia is right here. So they're right next to each other. So it makes sense that that's going to have a play a role. And then there's also Hindi. And Hindi is the language of northern India. Now, these three combine to create Urdu. Right? Uh, and nowadays you see the map, right? Of course, Pakistan uh, it speaks Urdu, and that's their official, actual, their official language. Uh, but we also see it's still popular in northern India, right? And it makes sense because, you know, this is where the Muslims were most found in, and therefore that's where there's going to be more likely that the languages are going to blend together uh, in northern India. So, uh, northern South Asia, I should say. So, um, Urdu is this new language, uh, and it is a syncretic language, very, very similar to, uh, say, Swahili, right, in Africa. All right, uh, let's quickly move to Southeast Asia. There's a whole bunch of different kingdoms mentioned in Southeast Asia, most of which we don't need to worry about. But one thing I do want to point out is this, to this map, right? So we have China over here. We have India somewhere around here. And all the ships sailing out of China and all the ships sailing out of India, they will pass through here, what is called the Strait of Malacca, right? It's this thin little waterway, right, that connects the Indian Ocean, Right, with the South China Sea or the Pacific Ocean over here. Right? And uh, basically this was the main water route right? Be, you know, of the Indian Ocean between China and India. And anyone going through there, right, any ship going through there had to pay taxes. Right? So whoever controlled the Strait of Malacca right, controlled the trade and therefore you know, can grow quite wealthy. So this area is always going to be under competition because different people want to control it because there's so much wealth. And uh, it was more economic, economical and faster, obviously, to go for a, sh for a ship to go through the Strait of Malacca than it would be to go all the way around 
uh, you know, these different islands. So, um, the Indians, uh, during going way back to the classical era, Indian merchants had been spreading their culture into Indochina. Now, Indochina is the term that sometimes is used to refer to Southeast Asia. So we have China over here, we have India over here, Indochina is right in the middle, right, this region. So Southeast Asia. Uh, anyway, so uh, through the arrival of Indian merchants, we see the popularity of Hinduism spread, and we see Buddhism spread as well. Um, so the Hinduism, you know, even though it is an Indian religion, and uh, it didn't spread pretty much anywhere else, it did kind of spread into Southeast Asia. And there's even evidence of this because uh, the, the, the kings of these different uh, kingdoms in Southeast Asia, they take on the title of Raja. And Raja is a Indian word, a Sanskrit word, which is the Indian writing system, um, that means king, right? So the rulers of the Southeast Asian kingdoms uh, were calling themselves Raja, right? So again, this is evidence of uh, this, you know, cultural diffusion. Uh, we also see it in architecture. So this is in Southeast Asia, and they have this temple, and it's a Hindu temple, uh, and it has all the characteristics of any Hindu temple that you would see uh, in India, right? Lots of statues, lots of spires, um, which is, again, common features of, of Hinduism. Uh, one of the kingdoms was called the Funan, right, that ruled this part over here, uh, and they helped control trade, uh, and they were also very successful when it came to, you know, agriculture and stuff like that. Uh, but they were eventually replaced by another group called the Angkor, or, or the Khmer's, uh, and they... Um, uh, they were heavily influenced by India, so we see that they are going to have, uh, they're going to use that rice that we saw in, in, in Vietnam and, and in China, where they have the multiple rice harvests, right, that fast-growing, fast-ripening rice. Uh, they're going to have these huge, huge, huge temples um, that are Hindu temples, but then uh, eventually they get kind of like switched to Buddhist temples. So you have Hinduism and Buddhism in Southeast Asia, blending together, uh, architecturally speaking. And this is what we call Angkor Wat, is a famous um, site in modern-day Cambodia. Cambodia, of course, is in Southeast Asia. All right, uh, then there's always the exception to the rules, right? So India had this big influence, whether it's through Buddhism or through Hinduism, uh, throughout Southeast Asia, right? Um, but Islam also made its way all the way to Southeast Asia. Uh, and the main place is called Malacca, right? Sometimes spelled with a K, sometimes spelled with a C. And Malacca is uh, in what we now will call Indonesia, uh, again, a Southeast Asian country. Uh, and, of course, the merchants were the first ones to sail there and, and start setting up their communities and start converting the people. Uh, the Sufis also make their way there and, you know, help popularize the religion uh, because of their, you know, their tolerance and stuff like that. And um, uh, Malacca, being a city-state in Southeast Asia, grows rich through trade, right, because they're exporting tons of...